thank you for joining us for this session titled Stakeholder Training Materials to Assess Freshwater Health. I'm Michael McLean of IHE Delft in the Netherlands, and I'll be moderating the session and also presenting a bit. I'd also like to acknowledge Ian Harrison of Conservation International, who's managing the technical aspects of the session. Conservant, uh, Conservation International has partnered with IHE Delft to convene this session. You may already be familiar with our institutions, but if not, Conservation International is an organization working to stabilize our climate by protecting and restoring nature, doubling ocean protection and expanding planet positive economies. They do this through innovations in science and finance, by partnering with communities, working with governments and engaging with companies. IHE Delft is the largest international water education facility in the world working in partnership to strengthen capacity in the water sector to achieve global sustainable development. So we're also interested in protecting and restoring healthy freshwater ecosystems and understanding how they contribute to sustainable development. Now from the list of registered participants, we know that we have an extraordinary range of institutions from around the world participating in the session today. And if you haven't done it yet, please go to the poll and indicate what type of organization you represent and what region you principally work in. We'd also like to learn, <clears throat> excuse me, we'd also like to learn the main reason you're interested in this session and why you think maintaining freshwater ecosystem health is important. I believe Ian will post a message in the chat window to direct you to the polls if you can't find them already. You'll also be able to post questions at any time to the speakers and panelists. And Ian will also post a message in the chat for how to do that. Now, our objective in this session is not to present information about the decline in freshwater ecosystem health worldwide. We assume you're all aware of this and you're here because you wanna do something about it. But protecting and restoring freshwater health is incredibly complex because these systems are themselves ecologically complex and they're being impacted by a range of pressures associated with different sectors of our economies and different scales and branches of our governments. Addressing the issues requires integrated approaches and dynamic engagement and cooperation among many stakeholders. So in this session, we'd like to focus on two key needs for effective communication and cooperation between stakeholders working to protect or restore freshwater health. The first is the need for a structured framework for cooperation, where necessary data can be assembled and transformed into meaningful indicators of baseline conditions and targets for future improvement, where resource managers, engineers, policymakers, and other stakeholders can jointly evaluate scenarios, understand trade-offs, prioritize interventions, and communicate base and health, <clears throat> and communicate base and health to a broader audience. So here we'd like to introduce you to Conservation International's Freshwater Health Index, or FHI. We'll begin with a presentation describing the Freshwater Health Index, followed by presentations of two case studies demonstrating its use. We'll then have a panel discussion in which you can pose any questions you have. The second need we'd like to focus on is the development of a common level of knowledge and understanding among cooperating stakeholders about the nature of freshwater health the pressures impacting it, indicators to measure it, and the governance and management approaches needed to address it. Achieving this common knowledge and understanding is an important first step to uh, effective cooperation. And here we'd like to introduce you to a new open online course on the fundamentals of freshwater health and invite you to register for it if you wish. So after we finish the first panel, we'll briefly introduce you to the online course and then again, invite your questions. So now for our first speaker, Silindili Mshali. Silindina is an associate scientist for Conservation South Africa. She's been implementing the Freshwater Health Index in the Mzimvubu catchment in South Africa. Ian, can you cue uh, the presentation, please? Sorry, one, one moment, I just need to re-optimize. <laughs> Try it again. 
All right, take your time and we'll get it right. Okay, okay. Here we go. Good day, everyone. My name is Selindi Lemtali. I will be giving you an overview of the Freshwater Health Index tool. So this tool was developed by Conservation International uh, with, with several partners, essentially to bring, to provide a comprehensive view of freshwater health in a basin. Um, and this tool provides a unique way to kind of draw connections between the ecosystem, uh, the services it provides to the people, and more importantly, the governance management system that exists within the catchments. So the FHI is not really intended for a single use or a single um, entity using applying this tool, but is a way to kind of engage several stakeholders in the catchments to discuss freshwater systems. It's, it allows for people to work together to discuss scenarios, to discuss trade-offs between different actors and different scenarios, and to kind of prioritize our interventions in the catchments in terms of catchment management. So, and, and being able to kind of discuss this with a broader set of um, people. So in the next few slides, I'll be then discussing uh, what the FHI is about, what framework it's based on, and more information will follow. So the FHI framework is based on the SES approach, which is the social ecological system. It, it's one that reflects the connections between humans and the environment. So the dotted line around this framework represents the, the catchment boundary or the basin boundary where the FHI is being applied. And within the boundary, there are human actors, which are your stakeholders, and who seek to modify and use certain ecosystem services um, that are provided by the environment. And ecosystem vitality represents the status and the trends of our ecosystem. So in relation to obtaining certain level of services from the ecosystem. And as the ecosystem changes, so as the services that it provides to people. So we have to understand this. Um, and this interaction between these three spheres, the, the stakeholders, ecosystem vitality, and the services it provides is regulated by a set of rules or regulations, which is the governance of the whole system. And the FHI is based on this framework. So this is the graphic output from the FHI assessment, and it's the three components that I mentioned. It's the maintenance of ecosystems um, central to freshwater health, which is the ecosystem vitality. It's the ecosystem services, which is the services that are, are obtained from the ecosystem. And it's the governance component, which assesses the collective action from stakeholders. So these are the three elements that are measured and they are um, scaled from a rating scale of zero to 100, where zero is uh, very critical and 100 is very good. And these three components are composite scores. So the scores in the middle of the circles are composites of the inner circle, which is the indicators. And the indicators are a composite of the outer circle, which is the sub indicators to be able to calculate the overall score in the middle. So as you can see for the ecosystem services and the governance and stakeholders components, those two components, the wedges vary in size. And this is essentially because of um, the different sub indicators and indicators are not given equal weights. So stakeholders can kind of identify and specify that um, some indicators weigh more, hence deemed to be prioritized than other um, indicators. So this kind of informs prioritization in our actions. So it gives room for indicators for, sub, so for stakeholders to inform the whole process. So essentially the FHI we like to use the analogy of um, it's, it's taking the catchments or the basin to the doctor. So we're taking the basin to the doctor to get a full report on how the basin is doing. What are What's going good in the basin and what's not going so good? So what are the challenges? What needs to be addressed? What needs to be prioritized? What needs to be um, addressed urgently in order to maintain the health and the functioning of our freshwater systems? 
Um, so we'd like to think of it as that. So essentially, these are the, the three scores, the ecosystem vitality and the ecosystem services, and then the governance components. These um, different components are not um, added together because they are distinctly different. And, and that's the FHI output from this process. So what are these indicators and sub-indicators? So they are summarized in this slide. So for ecosystem vitality, you're looking at water quantity, water quality, basin condition, and biodiversity, and a number of sub-indicators are under that. And then for ecosystem services, you're looking at provisioning, regulating and supporting services, and lastly, cultural services. And for governance, you're looking at the enabling environment, stakeholder engagement, vision and adaptive governance, and lastly, the effectiveness of our governance systems. So we are looking at a variety of data sets to kind of fill this information and get a comprehensive view of how the catchment is doing. So this is through remotely sensed data, monitored information, modeled data, as well as surveyed data. So the key goals of the FHI can be summarized into three points. One is to raise awareness among stakeholders around the condition of our freshwater system in the catchment and the importance of ecosystem services and governance. And secondly, to model future scenarios and indicators to provide stakeholders with like credible uh, and easy to understand um, way to examine trade-offs between different scenarios. And lastly, and more ambitiously, is to secure commitments from stakeholders to apply the outcomes of the FHI in order to inform better catchment management and to develop a, a, a common or shared vision around freshwater systems in the catchment. So often what we find is that people want to understand what makes the FHI different, what makes it different from any other freshwater assessment tools. So essentially, the, the FHI focuses on ecosystems. So we're trying to identify opportunities or areas for conservation within our freshwater systems, areas that need to be prioritized and need to be kind of addressed in order to maintain the health of our freshwater systems. It provides that opportunity. So it also allows for scenario analysis through comparing baseline and future scenarios. We are able to kind of understand um, the current changes in our catchment and understand trade offs of our decisions. Um, it allows for stakeholder engagement, as I'd mentioned a number of times through this presentation, is that it is heavily reliant on stakeholders providing the information, feeding into the process, and direct, directing the process. It's, it's provided, it's, it provides stakeholders the opportunity to kind of provide the data and information using local information, contextualizing, contextualizing the whole process, since as much as the FHI is a global tool, but through providing this local information, local knowledge from stakeholders, it can be used to address local challenges and local, and local issues. It assesses governance, and this is a key thing within the FHIs that most uh, freshwater systems try to understand the biophysical condition of the catchment. So uh, your water quality, your water quantity issues, um, your groundwater situation, but the FHI also tries to unpack some of the issues within our governance systems, since we all know that some of the challenges that we are experiencing within our catchments is not necessarily because of the degradation of our landscape or our ecosystems, but could be a reflection of um, a breakdown within our governance systems. The FHI allows for the breaking of silos as it brings people from different fields, from social field, from the environmental, from the economic field, to come together and discuss freshwater issues and freshwater system development. It is inclusive in the sense that it brings in different knowledge systems, traditional knowledge, scientific knowledge, from governance, from technology, to sit around the table and discuss um, freshwater issues. It provides clarity in the sense that it uses a rating scale of 0 to 100 for people to be comfortable enough to discuss um, very scientific or um, technologically inclined language to be able to engage in such a, a conversation, even though you don't have that background. And it allows for people to draw linkages from different components. So 
from from analyzing the scores from ecosystem vitality you can understand that if it's poor it won't necessarily be able to provide the necessary ecosystem services if our ecosystem is not in a good condition so it's you, you it allows for people to draw those linkages between the different components and the different indicators it is fit for purpose as it allows for stakeholders to kind of um provide data provide information about the catchments that broadens our local understanding of our local challenge so people are able to the, the local data and the local information makes the fhi fit for purpose within that catchment it is contextualized within the the issues that exist within the the, 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 the landscape so the fhi is not just a desktop tool it's not just a series of reports and numbers Yes, it's what we get out of the process, but the FHI is also a platform and a standardized way to get multiple stakeholders that, that work within the, the same area and the catchment to sit around the table and kind of discuss freshwater systems and to kind of discuss water resources management. These engagements take place and are facilitated through stakeholder forums, stakeholder workshops, group discussions, um, indicator validation, and sharing of scenario developments and suggestions from the stakeholders. So the FHI is, is a very iterative process of calculating the indicators, presenting it to a group of stakeholders, have them provide the data, information, and guide the process and, 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 and kind of shape how, how the process kind of moves forward in order to validate some of the information that we're getting from the process. The FHI is intended to be applied at a catchment level, and these are all of the catchments where the FHI has been applied to date. So in the next a few presentations, my colleagues will be giving an overview of the FHI application in, the Brazil, in Brazil and in China. Uh, overall, the FHI has been applied in 11 countries with 290 stakeholders with 160 institutions represented across all of these catchments. Thank you so much for your time. The next presentation will be on case studies where the FHI has been applied. And I'd like to introduce my colleagues, Mayra Bezera, who's been applying the FHI in the Guando Basin in Brazil, and Yi Cheng, who's been applying the FHI in the Poyang Lake Basin in China. Silly, thank you very much. Uh, boy, you're taking over my job here of announcing the next speakers, but I welcome that. And participants, remember, please, that you can post your questions at any time for the speakers, for Sili. And I want to ensure you that Sili is also here with us live, and you will, you will see her when we arrive at the panel. And as she suggested, let's continue now with the presentation of our case studies applying the Freshwater Health uh, Index. First, we'll hear from Maera Bezeja. She's an associate scientist in the Moore Center for Science at Conservation International. She's worked on numerous FHI assessments across Africa and Latin America and will present a case from Brazil. Then we'll immediately hear from Yi Ching Zhang, an associate scientist also for Conservation International, primarily focused in the Asia Pacific region, who will present a case from China. All right, Ian, let's cue those up and then we'll have the live panel discussion afterwards, everyone. And you are muted, Ian, just so you know. And folks, also, please remember that the polls are still open. I've been monitoring that a little bit, and it's a, it's a wonderful distribution uh, across Asia, Africa, uh, and many folks working globally. And we have a good representation of folks working with NGOs, which I know that NGOs, you often find yourself in that facilitation role, trying to encourage that stakeholder cooperation. And uh, so this is, you know, hopefully will be a, a very beneficial and wonderful tool for your use as well. 
and some good representation from the, the private sector. We're so happy to have you here and that you're expressing interest in this topic and hopefully becoming more and more engaged in, uh, in these processes, trying to protect the, the, the resources that, that very likely your, uh, your company, your industry might also be reliant on. And of course, a sprinkling of academics like myself always that are present and we love to continually be learning and also participating in these processes. All right, Ian, are we ready with the next two? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not hearing you, just so you know. Uh, I show that you're muted. I might be able to unmute you myself. I don't seem to be able to. Ian, why don't you take, just, just take a moment to write in the chat window for me so that I understand what is happening. And another possibility is uh, Silindili could field a question or two now, if we need to, while some of the technical issues are worked out in the background. While we're sorting that out, I'm gonna go ahead and go back to, the, back to the poll here and have a look. I believe everyone sees these poll results on the right-hand side of your screen, the image that you're seeing now. You see the distribution of regions, again, good representation from Europe, Southeast Asia, and this makes sense for the time zones that we're working in right now, of course. Uh, from the Middle East, welcome, Sub-Saharan Africa, and again, a lot of folks working globally. And some of uh, your reasons for focusing on this. Nice to see that some folks you know, have come specifically to learn something about the Freshwater Health Index. And I see from others that it's because this topic is, is part of the focus of your own work. So we certainly hope that it will prove beneficial for you. And also I see a, a researcher uh, reaching out and engaging. You know, we as academics now have a responsibility to go beyond just our academic studies and academic publications to really engage in, in, in applying the knowledge that's generated. We've got a bit of a word cloud there with some of the, the key words coming through. Resource sustainability, life survival, water, biodiversity, people, people, people. All right, and also some, it looks like we have a contribution from someone at IUCN that uh, is uh, also sharing some information and updating us, right? That IUCN is hoping to have globally comprehensive red list assessments completed for a range of taxonomic groups by mid 2022. You'll see that in the use of the freshwater health index and as well as in the use of, um, or in the use of the freshwater health index, uh, a lot of attention is given to and data from IUCN are part of the assessment. So anything improving those databases and making more information available for such assessments is going to be greatly appreciated. Well, I believe that I may be the only person visible at the moment to participants. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to make an executive decision and I'm gonna share my screen and tell you something about the second tool or resource that we want to inform you about in, the, uh, in, in this session. And that is an, a free and open online course on the topic of freshwater health. So I'm sharing my screen now, and I'm going to open this presentation. Excuse me. Here we are. Let me try this again. Very good. I have some colleagues that I can see. Can someone nod for me if it looks like the presentation is up? All right. Uh, thank you very much. So 
you're going to learn more about this, this dual set of resources. There's the Freshwater Health Index as, as, as a framework, as a real tool to engage with your stakeholders. But one of the critical elements, as I pointed out, is there needs to be some common level of understanding about the topic among stakeholders to make that cooperation and collaboration more effective. So we've created this open online course. And this, what I, you're seeing on the screen is actually the first of what will be a two-part course. We're beginning with the fundamentals in part one, which I'm introducing now, and we'll delve into more advanced topics in part two, which will be offered in early 2022. Now the course is designed for you to take at your own pace, which means you can study at whatever time is convenient for you. The course is open to anyone interested in protecting and restoring freshwater ecosystem health, but it was designed with practitioners, policymakers, and informed stakeholders in mind, helping to build that base of common knowledge and understanding needed to cooperate effectively in the dynamic integrated process of protecting or restoring freshwater health. Registration is open now for the course, and it will begin in one month's time on the 28th of September. Now, to begin at that date, you should register by the 21st of September, so you've still got some time. The total study load for the course is estimated to be 24 hours, or approximately four hours per week over a six-week period. Right? We know that people are going to try to uh, incorporate this course and in learning into a busy schedule already, so we've tried to pace the course in a way that will give you, you know, enough intense attention to it, but at the same time, uh, not overtax you. Now, the course was developed and is delivered by a team of experts with years of experience in the science and practice of freshwater ecosystem protection and restoration. You will, by the end of this session, recognize uh, uh, some of these participants, right? And you can learn about all of us through the links that are available in the course. Now, our objectives for you in this course are ambitious and intended to increase your understanding of key aspects of freshwater health and set you on the first steps of being able to evaluate it. So at the end of the course, these are Bloom taxonomic learning objectives. At the end of this course, we expect you'll be able to categorize the freshwater ecosystems found in a basin by type, describe the societal use of water in terms of freshwater ecosystem services, analyze the pressures and threats shaping freshwater ecosystems in terms of biodiversity and supply of services, assess the role of ecosystems in maintaining supply of services, and evaluate the effectiveness of systems managing the social and ecological aspects of freshwater in a basin. Now to achieve these objectives, the course content is organized into six topics. We'll begin by learning about freshwater ecosystems themselves, how they're structured and how they function. We'll then learn how people benefit from ecosystems and even rely on them. Next, we'll look at the main pressures impacting freshwater health and how health can be monitored using indicators. Finally, we'll explore how poor freshwater health is addressed through good management and govern governance. And as you know, you'll also be introduced to the Freshwater Health Index and how it can be used to integrate all of these topics into meaningful evaluations of basin health. A deeper dive into each of these topics and their evaluation using the Freshwater Health Index will come in that second course on advanced topics. For each topic, you'll learn by watching interactive lectures, reading relevant literature, and doing practical exercises. Lectures are limited to 20 minutes or less each, and the interactions allow you to test your knowledge along the way and, or follow links to related resources if you wish. The readings come mainly from formal publications of international bodies like the Ramsar Secretariat, as well as papers in the peer-reviewed literature. And exercises are designed to not only deepen your knowledge and develop skills, but also to expose you to some of the important sources of data, such as IUCN's Red List. You'll access the course through the open education platform of IHE Delft, and there you may find courses on other topics of interest as well. In many cases, the courses available on this platform are nearly identical to the courses we offer face-to-face -face at IHE Delft, but we've adapted them to be open and online. So if you're interested in joining the course, please follow the link that's available on the page. It's in, I think it's, uh, it's in the, uh, the files folder there. 
right? So please follow that link because there you'll also find some detailed instructions on how to register. And we really hope to see, uh, to see many of you in the class. So thank you for that. I'm going to stop pausing my screen. I also invite questions about the open online course that we are offering as well. But at this time, I'd like to go back to Ian. Ian, are we, uh, are we good for our case studies now? Yes, we should be. I'm, I apologize for my, my computer and uh, Zoom and Possible just froze up on. I had to that's log exactly out and log back in. Moments. I, I was talking <laughs> outside. I thought I was about to get a delivery from a package guy too. So I'm really happy that, you know, we're, we're holding it together. And look, you know, it's just 30 minutes into the hour. So we've got plenty of time. We've still got a lot to talk about. And uh, let's get started with that. All right, so handing it over to Ian to kick off the case study presentations. Right. Um, <clears throat> oh, no sound. Oh. I think as you enter, there was something to click, yes? Yep, one moment. Uh... All right, here we go. Thank you, Michael and Sealy, and hello, everybody. My name is Maida Bezerra. I am an associate scientist with Moore Center for Science at Conservation International. And I'm here today to share with you a little bit of our experience applying the Freshwater Health Index in the Guandu Basin in Brazil. And throughout the presentation, please remember that Freshwater Health Index is FHI for short. So let's start off by understanding why we apply the FHI in the Guandu Basin. The Guandu is one of the most important basins in Brazil because it provides water to the second largest metropolitan area in that country, the Rio de Janeiro metro area. Currently, about 9 million people receive water from Guandu. The basin also supports an industrial complex of national importance and is used for hydroelectricity generation as well. Attending all the water demand is only possible because the Guandu Basin have been highly modified throughout uh, the years. And this is because the water volumes from the Guandu Basin itself are not enough to support all water demand in the region. And the figure here is an illustration of how complex the basin actually is. For example, you can see in the picture that there are dams, reservoirs and channels uh, constructed in series, and this was done to utilize transposed water from the, an adjacent basin, the Paraíba do Sul, and of course water from the Guandu Basin. With all this engineering work, currently water volumes of the Guandu River have increased by 15 times, and that's a lot. So this complex, uh, this complexity in terms of engineering and the fact that the basin has this national importance was a very good challenge for us with the FHI. So in the remaining time, I would like to focus on the key challenges highlighted by the application of the FHI in Guandu, and also present the impacts that the FHI had in resolving these challenges or helping providing some direction to the resolution of these challenges. There are three main aspects that we believe that the FHI process contributed the most. First is related to the development of the first hydrological model. We think it was the first hydrological model based on research. Uh, and this process helped the stakeholders recognize the need to improve the monitoring scheme in the basin. Also, the FHI results called the attention of the commonly absent industrial sector, which is a key stakeholder for water resource management. And finally, we like to highlight that a shared vision for the basin emerged, which can contribute to a more democratic way of decision making. 
going a little bit into more detail related to these three aspects, first regarding the hydrological model, this process of development of the model uh, exposed the deficient monitoring scheme present in the basin, and not only for weather data, but also for discharge data. This deficient made the basin committee recognize the need to improve the monitoring scheme in the basin. The figures here are just an example of the challenge that we faced. Uh, the map above shows listed rain stations in official websites, but only those in the map below actually had acceptable data. So by trying to find data, not finding the data, or finding data that was much limited in terms of the temporal scale that was available, was very important to highlight the need to, be, to have better data so we can have better models. Regarding the industrial sector, this sector was nearly absent from the engagement promoted by the FHI process. A fact that is very problematic because Guandu is the basin where the industrial sector of the entire state of Rio concentrates. However, by the end of the FHI process, the industrial sector became interested in the FHI results and actually promoted the FHI results. The figure here is the press release used by the Industries Association promoting the final stakeholder meeting which the association itself also helped to organize. Most importantly, from that meeting, a shared vision for the basin emerged and emerged considering different sectors, including the industrial sector this time. Finally, the FHI process was also an opportunity for the stakeholders to experience how decisions could be taken more democratically. By showing the FHI results, particularly the relatively good score for the ecosystem services component, but the lowest score for the ecosystem vitality component contributed to the collective recognition that the provision of ecosystem services in the basin in the near term appears unsustainable because of degrading ecosystem conditions. Stakeholders, therefore, were able to recognize the need of a more holistic decision-making process that takes into consideration not only water quantity, which is usually the focus in the Wandu, but also other aspects and interests in the basin. So with that, I hope that by presenting challenges that we face and, how, and also how the FHI could help, uh, resolving those challenges, I was able to illustrate how the FHI can contribute to better watershed management. Thank you so much for your attention. Very interesting case. And I think the second case is just coming immediately after this. Yes, um, one moment. <clears throat> Aida, unfortunately, is not with us. She's in, I, I, I guess she's in Brazil, so very difficult time zone. She'll be joining us for the second version of this session, which will happen tomorrow. So she's the one, uh, one speaker that we have that won't be uh, personally available for questions, although we have other you know, experts in FHI that also have experiences in that same case. So any questions you have about that case also, please uh, include them. All right, here we go. Hi, everyone. I'm Yixin Zhang, an associate scientist at Conservation International. Thanks, Myra, for the presentation about FHI's application in the Guangdu Basin. In this presentation, I will share with you the application of the FHI in a very different setting, a larger wetland-dominated freshwater system, which is the focus of my work. Poyang Lake is the largest freshwater lake in China, with its basin outline largely reflecting Jiangxi province. Drained by five tributaries, the lake system is a prime water source for tens of millions of residents in the middle and lower Yangtze River basin, as well as a growing industrial base. The lake is home to over 50% of Finland's purposes, an iconic and critically endangered species. It is also the wintering spot 
for more than 98% of the world's Siberian cranes, another critically endangered species. Poyang Lake is recognized for its irreplaceable role in sustaining global biodiversity and the cornerstone for ecological security of the middle and lower reaches of the Yangtze River. This large freshwater lake basin has a growing urban and industrial base, yet the local population also has a keen awareness of the lake's importance for biodiversity. This creates competing interests for water resource management and at times could lead to conflicting goals for different stakeholder groups. In this large basin with competing demands, it has been challenging to build a consensus around freshwater resource management. I'd like to share two key impacts that FHI has had in addressing some of these challenges. In a basin with multiple industrial parks, drawing on the lake water and discharging wastewater into it, learning to engage corporate partners in areas of local freshwater health is fundamental. In 2019, CI partnered with a viscose company called Satory to look at freshwater health and watershed conservation in the Poyang Lake Basin. Working with Satory, we articulated how water stewardship can move beyond the manufacturing facility to engage with other stakeholders of the basin in a more systematic and long-term effort, benefiting both a corporation and the basin in which it operates. To better illustrate this continuum, we developed a practical roadmap for corporate freshwater health stewardship called the Backyard Basin Roadmap. It consists of nine milestones that build on one another and scale from the facility itself to basin scale. These milestones guide the development of a holistic corporate freshwater health stewardship strategy that can be adapted to different basins and production facilities. Through the assessment, we engage stakeholders across sectors within the basin to promote collective action toward a healthier Poyang Lake one of our stakeholder meetings took place following unprecedented flooding in Poyang and Yangtze and helped different stakeholders better understand the joint stake they all have in securing Poyang's future. Through the workshops, local practitioners confirmed that there is still much work to be done to preserve and sustainably manage this important place. The communication and exchange among protected areas academic institutions and NGOs have been enhanced, and an opportunity for further cooperation has been created. Finally, one of our key achievements was to provide a voice to grassroots organizations at the province level. These organizations are enthusiastically managing critical wetlands of the lake basin and are directly impacted by the future of the lake. Just to give you a glimpse of their passion, the left picture shows a migrant bird library, which was built for children's education in the community. While the right picture shows Xiaoyang, an old sand transporting vessel as scrap metal retrofitted to patrol the lake and protect its biodiversity. So while the FHR report provides a comprehensive baseline health assessment of Poyang Lake Basin, as Celine Dyer mentioned in her remarks on FHI, its key contributions stem from the process of working with diverse stakeholders and discovering how to preserve the health of our watersheds. With that, I hand it back to you, Michael. Yiching, thank you very much. Two interesting cases huh, that, that really illustrate how this tool can be used in, in two very different situations as well. All right, everyone. Well, we've come to the moment where we want to bring some of these presenters to you, bring them into the picture and, uh, and have a, a period of time for discussion and answering questions. So Ian, if you could please go ahead and spotlight the folks who will be involved the participants on this panel. This is our first panel, as you know. Uh, <clears throat> you've already met through their presentations, Celine Dili and Yu Qing. Uh, they will be available on the panel. But we also have, in addition, Kashif Shah, 
and Nick Suter. Now, Kashif, the handsome man in the white shirt there, he is director of hydroinformatics in the Moore Center for Science at, in Conservation at Conservation International. And he's one of the original FHI uh, team members who helped develop the tool and methodology. Nick's also with Conservation International and is freshwater manager for the Greater Mekong. He's just appeared on the screen there, at least just appeared on my screen. Welcome. And he's worked on FHI assessments in the lower Mekong region and has also given input to the FHI development since its early days. So welcome, panel members. Thank you for being with us. And let's see, I, I also see Ellen on the screen. <clears throat> Is Ian, can you confirm? Is uh, Ellen also visible and part of the panel? Oh, you're muted though. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, you should have, yeah, you should have six of you up on the screen now. All right. Excellent. So we have six participants. So some, some questions have been coming in, in the poll section of the of Pathable. And thank you for those. Please feel free to add others. I saw a couple of folks <clears throat> were posting their question in the chat. Ideally they would go in the poll section, but we can flip back and forth and, and try to look at that. But of the questions I see so far, well, the, the first one looks quite straightforward and simple. And, and perhaps I could ask Kashif to respond to this. And that is, <clears throat> why, why hasn't FHI been applied in Europe yet? It's certainly a place, <clears throat> certainly a part of the world that's in need of uh, improvement of freshwater health. Hi, thanks, Michael. Uh, and thank you for Astrid for that question. Actually. This is something that we would like to do in the future, but uh, to just to give a background of how we, where we are and how we got there, uh, FHI actually started as more as a grassroots things where Conservation International was actually working in field offices around the world with local communities, sometimes indigenous communities. And these communities like Conservation International have really at their heart the protection of the freshwater ecosystems. They know a lot more about the fish species that are present in, in danger than a typical water manager would for that same area, right? Um, and so what happened was when they wanted to bring their, CI wanted to help bring their voice to uh, the decision-making scale at the basin. Um, and sometimes in many of the countries where CI works, um, we found that there was no table to bring them to. You know, it's in, in these basins, uh, IWRM, Integrated Water Resource Management, is like the fantastic beast. Everyone would like to have them, but nobody can find them. And so FHI really started as, as a way to create that, that forum at the basin scale where we could start uh, having these voices um, have a space um, to talk about uh, issues of fresh water that were closer to the mission and interest of Conservation International as well as these local communities. So we really started in, in data poor, capacity poor regions. Uh, we have been uh, thinking about gradually moving to more and more data rich regions to even test out our methodology. But with the course that's coming up, we are really hoping that we will have a lot more input into how these methods could adopt to different regions. And so maybe I'll flip this question back to you. How can you apply this to Europe next time after the online course? Oh, I love that. All right, bring the challenge back to us. Now, we're talking in this session about how critical it is to bring stakeholders together to, to address these, these challenging and complex problems. So we have a wonderful question here about how to identify who the right stakeholders are to bring together in, in these discussions, in these processes. Now, I know there's a lot of experience with stakeholders on the panel. I wonder if I could invite Ellen to, to, to start this off with a bit more. Uh, she's, of course, coming from the, our academic side and studying this topic a lot. So maybe Ellen could, as well as being part of the process, maybe Ellen could say a few initial words, and then let's open it up to, to folks uh, active in the application of FHI to share how you know, the process where you have been choosing folks. And maybe I can ask uh, Celine Dilly and, and Nick to say a word about that. But Ellen, you first, can you share a few thoughts on this? 
Uh, thank you, Michael. Uh, well, I think from my perspective, this is maybe the most important question of all because tools don't solve problems. People solve problems. And one of my old professors always said, a fool with a tool remains still a fool. Uh, so the question of who is in the room to discuss freshwater health is uh, actually the question of do you achieve results or do you just uh, in, in terms of improving quality or do you just have a bunch of numbers? Um, the second thing is that um, it is not just a question of, of who has information in the beginning, but people talking to each other and Celine Dele introduced it at, at the beginning, having a conversation about the numbers, learning from each other, and in the process agreeing of what is a problem and what needs to be done, that is actually where, where the change is, is, is really happening. Now, from my perspective of how do you identify the right people, there are three things involved. One is you need a really good process facilitation because there is a tendency in people to talk to like-minded people. And that actually often excludes the people you really need from the room. So somebody who is very conscious of who needs to be part of the dialogue and helps to pass this along um, is one thing in the identification. The second thing is it's always important to have things like you know, search profiles that kind of prepares what categories of people are you looking for. Important example, one says we need the private sector, but when it comes to freshwater health, there are companies that use freshwater, people that rely on the freshwater to be healthy, like tourism. There are just massively powerful companies that influence everything that happens in a geographic area. And there might be companies that are very interested in being good corporate citizens. So they might bring power to the table, even though they have nothing to do with the water. And to point out and, and go outside the box, you know, with this, you know, have you thought about looking for a company like that uh, can bring this along? And the third step I'd recommend from my practical experience also is it has to be a multi-step process because the first conversation might not recognize what you need. So to actually go back after the first or second round and say, okay, we now agreed that this is an issue. Are there actually other groups, people out there who are relevant to that and you recognize the, 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 uh, the relevance of certain groups and then bring them in at this, at this stage after a core group um, has made the first steps. That is the third thing I would recommend. Ellen, thank you very much. Excellent points. I saw a lot of nodding as well uh, among the panel members that, uh, that those points that you make uh, really hit home. So maybe just quickly, Silin Lily, could you follow up quickly about, uh, about in your application of uh, ed FHI, how you have, uh, how you selected your stakeholders. And then Yiching, I'll ask you to please, uh, you know, for your case study as well, share the process that you went through. To you, Celine Dilley. Thanks, thanks, Michael. Um, I totally agree with Ellen. Uh, she mentions really key steps that you need to take when you are selecting the group of stakeholders that you'll be working with. So with the FHI, there's an initial stage of mapping your stakeholders who's impacted by our water resources and who impacts our water resources. So you start at the broader level. So that's what you're trying to understand. And you, these of course include formal institutions where it's your government, provincial, municipalities and so on. And you're not so formal stakeholders, which will be like your NGO communities, traditional leaders and so on that you feel are in the process. And it's important because they provide a wealth of knowledge since, as, as Ellen said, people, stakeholders know their area and they can provide more information and direct the process in the way that you kind of achieve the objectives of applying this FHI tool. And um, it's important to kind of understand that and have that in mind when you engage in stakeholders, as well as because your stakeholders are involved in this process, they kind of sense check if you have the right people in the room. So um, they will tell you, like in the case of Imzumvubu, where we started off and we engaged with stakeholders and we brought them all together. And um, through the stakeholder workshops, stakeholders then mentioned that, wait, hold on, uh, there's a missing key stakeholder that's not in the conversation, which is like, critical to the objectives of the FHI. And these were traditional authorities. Um, and in the landscape, those are key sta stakeholders that we want to, of course, include. And then we had to kind of pause uh, the process, get them in the room, get them talking around freshwater systems and um, hear their views and then we proceed forward. So it's a very iterative process as Ellen mentioned that it's a mighty criteria, multi-level um, 
process of engaging stakeholders and making sure that you have the right people in the room. Similarly, thank you. Uh, everyone, I have my eye on the clock as well, and I see that we have uh, about five minutes left. I would, Yiching, I would love to give you a moment to also share your approach to which stakeholders you engaged in, uh, in your China case study. And then I want to hand a question to Nick that has come uh, about the use of IUCN data. Go ahead, Yiching. Michael, uh, first of all, I would like to say we choose the right, right uh, uh, stakeholders uh, based on their passionate. Uh, um, for example, it's very hard to engage the uh, the industry partners. So we we actually ch choose the partners with um, the passion, and they, they thought they are they are responsible for the Poyang Lake. And second, we choose the 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 researcher partners based on their experience, like some. Some of the re uh, researchers in in Jiangxi province, they they spend like um, tens of years uh, doing research in Poyang, and they they actually have more resources uh, like the the data compared to us. So we choose the most uh, experienced researchers so that they can uh, they can put their their uh, they can give us more um, local data. And sec uh, and the most important is we choose the government government um, uh, um, collaborators, um, which uh, we can recommend our our framework, our result to them so that they can make uh, the relevant policy um, based on our result. Yeah, that's my point of view. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much. Well, we, we spent some quality time on that. As Ellen said, perhaps the most important question about you know, who to engage. And I really appreciate the inputs on, on, on how to engage, just the, the, the process of making those decisions. I wanted to pass the question to Nick uh, what was the first question posed in our poll? And that's, does the FHI recommend standard procedures for local biodiversity surveys to ensure replicability and comparability between sites? Sounds logical. Nick. Thank you uh, for that question. So generally the answer is no. Um, we have for the biodiversity indicator, a process that we go through, and this is, so fairly important to remember about all of the indicators. So for biodiversity, we initially look at species of concern, which are red listed threatened species. So we assess the proportion of red listed to totally, so sorry, threatened red listed species to all assessed species on the red list in a basin. Then the next step, if you're doing it over time is, has the number of threatened species changed? So are there fewer or more? Sadly, there's more likely to be more these days than fewer. Then we are looking at, which is probably closer to the question, uh, change in population size of inter you know, interesting species over time. Um, because we operate at about a five year level, um, we wouldn't generally recommend going out and conducting local surveys. However, if a particular basin manager or someone working in a basin thinks that you know, they can come up with an indicator for biodiversity by going out and doing surveys, well, go for it. If it's useful to you, you do it. We're, we're not you know, completely, we're not prescriptive on what has to be done for the Freshwater Health Index. Um, you know, we're not gonna say, no, you can't do that. If it's useful for you, do it. Um, so, also the question about can you replicate and compare between sites? Again, we're not really that interested in comparing between river basins. Um, so the management is really based on a particular river basin and the conditions within that. Um, generally, if you were to compare between basins, the data used to come up with the assessments is often very different so it's not um, actually that useful to do it. Nick, thank you very much. Everyone, we're entering our final minute of our session. There's, there's a question that's been posed in the chat by Nishadi, and she says, thanks for the presentations. Why do you think the governance and social indicators are relevant to freshwater health? Nishadi, that's a fantastic question. I'm afraid we're not gonna have time to answer it with the panel, but we will respond in the chat window. So I would ask uh, you know, the panelists, we, we need someone, we need to figure out how to uh, respond to Nishadi's important question 
because I'm sure you have a lot to say about that. But looking at the time, everyone, I'd like to thank you all. I'd like to thank our speakers, our panelists for their contributions today. I'd very much like to thank all of you who participated. Now this session will be offered, hopefully with fewer technical issues, again tomorrow in a time slot that's five hours later at 1500 Central European Summer Time. If you've enjoyed the section, please recommend it to someone else and they can join tomorrow. So on behalf of the conveners of this session, I wish you all success in your work and a very happy final day and a half at this 2021 Stockholm World Water Week. Cheers, everybody. <laughs>